we'll have some time to discuss all, all uh, six papers at the end of the uh, session as well. Um, and uh, we'll now go into the, the second group of, of three papers. Just as a reminder to the presenters, uh, as you're presenting, I'll send you via the chat uh, an announcement. We have five minutes left and, and two minutes. Um, and then if I do come in on person, we need, we need to wrap up. Uh, the second group of papers um, in the innovation panel continue with case studies, but they also, I think they, they build um, on what we've been talking about and to offer specific techniques and, and strategies of framing and perhaps scoping it as, as well. So I think it'll be a nice, uh, a nice continuation of the discussion we're already having. The, the first paper in, the, uh, in our second group uh, will be presented by Krazy uh, Bojnikova uh, from Outcome. It was written um, also with her colleague Diana uh, Andrea Diana Zavate Outcome, as well as Kevin Richard in the Design and Critical Thinking Community. And the title of their paper is Multi-Ocean Strategy Framework: Designing Impactful Strategies for Multi-Actor Entanglement in the Ecosystem Economy. So that'll turn it over to Krazy. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm uh, thrilled to be here and have the opportunity to talk around our framework. Um, I hope you see my screen that I share. Okay, cool. So I'll begin. Uh, we structured the presentation covering three main topics that I think of uh, interest of this community. First, I would like to share some of the discoveries around the challenges that we saw with systemic approaches in strategy before I present to you multi-ocean strategy framework and our approach there. And finally, I'd like to leave you with uh, some uh, key conclusions that we observed after the research, which has been ongoing uh, for more than nine months right now. And with that, I'll begin. Uh, first with the challenges with uh, systemic approaches. Um, in this uncertain and rapidly changing world, we observe the strategy is no longer a single and static roadmap, but you can see it as a portfolio of possible future states or even a playbook based on optional radicality. We think that this approach is necessary because collectively organizations and uh, different stakeholders and even individuals, we have to break through existing boundaries in order to deliver impact and reset what is possible. And we also observe that organizations actually um, face this criticality to change, which comes down to the scale on one side, but also the speed of change, which is intersected by three uh, big trends, you could say. The one is the global ecosystem economy, which we find ourselves into, triggered by digital technologies, which uh, dissolve the barriers between different, um, uh, different uh, silos and different industries. And in the second aspect, we see a need to actually adopt a more holistic approaches to value creation, especially when you have different uh, stakeholders uh, involved in, in complex value chains. You have to change the paradigm of how the value is uh, conceived and also shared. And lastly, we also observe new standards for success that have on one side more inclusive perspective and on the other side, they are more longer term driven. For example, we spoke today already around the human-centric approach, but I would also say that there is a new trend talking and uh, thinking about the planet-centric approach, which would be an example of what are these new standards for success. And in the middle of this, we see systemic design actually playing a really critical role to sustain complexity, volatility, and ambiguity without uh, losing the ability to generate insights and share them with both internal and external stakeholders. Because for uh, organizations to implement successful strategies, they do require to consider a broader understanding of the interdependency of the systems. Also to think about these um, iterative feedback loops that allow to integrate the learnings and take on board the changes. And lastly, uh, we touched upon in the previous uh, presentations, these uh, new conditions for success and also the ability to shift quickly perspectives with the evolving context in order to reconsider what does it mean to create value and impact. And when organizations are able to achieve this and integrate a certain systemic principles like 
complexity, finding purpose, playing with emergence, or even, I would argue, adopting, adapting through self-organizations, they are able to take more informed and aligned decisions and bring on board to a common vision all these multi-stakeholders involved into it. But at the same time, we recognize that systemic design, uh, its implementation and adoption in strategic approaches is not without challenges. Organizations still struggle to anticipate change and work with disruption. They certainly find it very difficult to prioritize the prosperity of the ecosystem as a whole and align it to their own strategic priorities and goals. It is not so easy as a third point to think about the nonlinear dynamics between action and impact. And lastly, um, there is a, a big hurdle and limitation when it comes to rational tools that are predominantly uh, linear and very analytical. And we think the summary of these challenges comes down to this inability or challenge in a way to incorporate intangible elements in the value creation. And that's what we want to turn from a problem into an opportunity to suggest a way forward for connecting system thinking to ecosystem thinking that can uh, create more accessible and to some extent more effective process for innovation and impact. And we see this happening with the support of framework that integrate those components take into account the multiple perspectives, but also the dynamic roles of uh, the multi-stakeholders and uh, adopt and bring on board these new standards for success that are emerging right now or happening in the future. And with that in mind, this became our starting point for the journey uh, with Kevin and Diana, where we built the multi-ocean strategy framework. So you may ask, what is it exactly? And the simple way to think about it is, uh, a tool that consists of three big components. On one side, we have opportunity spaces. The second big pillar of the framework is uh, built around evolving relationship. And the third one uh, considers risks and disruptions. And when we are able to connect the dots and integrate multiple perspectives and find those relevant insights, we are actually able to take these responsible actions and come up with strategic responses, being to survive, adapt, expand, or ultimately transform any organization, industry, or even on an individual level. But because this is really a complex challenge to tackle and it requires multidisciplinary approach, we had to work with multiple dimensions. And our approach from that perspective incorporates five key components. First, we rely on infusing elements from strategy, branding and innovation uh, to help us have a richness of uh, a scope and also capabilities. The second big component of the framework was this idea to take on board situational game design, especially to allow for the agency of uh, the participants to tackle complex challenges and give them the emerging capabilities without prescribing a right approach going forward. Our third element um, in the framework is integrating narrative building because we wanted to have on one, hand, on one hand, a space for experimentation through visual uh, means, but on the other side, we were very much focused on the intangibility and the emergent component, and this was the means to achieve that. And that narrative building is supported through shared narratives and metaphors, which we use as a, a powerful tool to make sense and also bring on board very diverse um, stakeholders with different backgrounds and experiences. And the last bit that we took in the approach was to make sure that these components that are integrating so many different elements are actually, uh, they allow adaptation to the context because we wanted the framework to be applied across industries and ac across domains. And this modularity and adaptability allows us the flexibility to do so. And now uh, I'd like to briefly present the interactive elements into the framework. And in the next few minutes, I will cover with some short examples each one of them. So first we have oceans, which we appropriate in the framework as the value spaces. They are dynamic, uh, dynamic contexts with very unique conditions for success. Uh, and KPIs and differentiation. 
and there are five of them. The second pure is related to players, uh, which you can think of either archetypes or also as personas with specific traits and behaviors that are very important when we think about relationship building, when we think about trust, when we think about uh, collaboration and co-creation. The third pillar in the framework is related to uh, handling um, risks which threaten growth and relationship. And for us, we embody this in the metaphor of monsters. And we have four of these monsters that have unique characteristic. And the last bit where the action happens around the strategies are the four strategic responses that allow the organization to actually execute on its business model. So first, let's talk briefly about the oceans. And you will see a common denominator every time I present the element that it would have an attribute either the name, or the, uh, but then it will be paired with a certain key characteristic, which is very dominant uh, for, for that category. And as I mentioned, oceans are these dynamic markets with unique conditions that influence business model and differentiation. And also, um, it influences the KPIs of how success is measured. And I'd like to give uh, some examples to illustrate uh, what we mean. Uh, for example, if uh, organization is into the green ocean, which is highly sustainable, it's about regeneration, it's about impact mapping, what would matter in that specific ocean would be, on one hand, the, the sustainability aspect, on the other, you may say, the transparency of the value chain uh, and how the value is distributed. But to contrast such an uh, ocean with the yellow ocean, um, think of yellow ocean of any example of a software as a service company, which uh, favors very high efficiencies. Uh, it's about scale, it's about rapid growth, it's about onboarding different users. And uh, with this, uh, you begin to see that um, with such a nuanced approach, we are much better able to understand the dynamics in such spaces in order to appropriate the key resources that are required for success. In the second category, we work with players, and this is the representation of uh, different entities, uh, organizations, institutions, uh, or even individuals, which are dynamic, and they have their own characteristic in terms of attribute. Uh, here, I'd like to illustrate some examples to bring the players into light. Uh, my favorite, personally, is the Maverick, which is the representation of uh, disruption. And then, and you may wonder what kind of a company would embody this capability. And what came to mind when I was preparing for this presentation was actually to think about Tesla, how Tesla was, was able to disrupt the automotive industry with its electric uh, cars. Another example in the domain of the buyer, which is uh, influenced by the flow of exchange of information or goods, would be potentially to consider Amazon, the platform player with a strong mode related to uh, building uh, uh, economies of scale and attracting um, the variety and the, the breadth of the uh, products on it. And as a seeker, uh, a seeker perhaps would be a good uh, example to think about venture capital funds, those that are looking for the next hot industry, next big application. And allowing us to zoom into this uh, key attribute of the player is what uh, sheds a light into how a collaboration could look like based on trust and also based on conditions for long-term success. Moving forward are the monsters. Uh, again, monsters are a representation of internal and external risks that threaten business success and relationships. And monsters are perhaps the most um, interesting uh, component of the framework because you can consider monsters on the industry level. You can think of them specific to organization, but they also can be uh, appropriated on an individual basis. For example, if we think of an industry, plastic industry, uh, uh, an interesting uh, pair of the mermaid, which represent the notion of the seduction, would be this perception that perhaps we are recycling more than we are. But if you look at the data, I come from the Netherlands, only less than 10% of the plastic bottles right now are recycled. So uh, that's an example of uh, seduction in the form of risk. 
On the company level, if we think about for a minute for a MasterCard and we want to find what would be a Moby Dick in this context or what would be possibly MasterCard obsessing about, you can uh, you can imagine uh, and think along the lines of crypto, crypto coins which facilitate mainstream payments. Uh, and of course, um, it created a lot of hype and a lot of obsession in terms of growth and uh, opportunities going forward. On an individual level, the last example I want to give is to think about, we spoke about a little of uh, AI and the impact on the hybrid workers. So AI and hybrid workers, uh, a really interesting uh, monster that appears is the Leviathan, which embodies fear. And you may say that many uh, individuals um, are threatened to some extent and uh, fear AI if AI begins to perform better than they do and uh, it potentially um, causes a challenge to the security of their job. And thinking about these risks allows organizations and uh, 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 teams that work with this framework to be more proactive and adaptive as opposed to responsive uh, to the environment and the changing context. And the last component of the framework that I want to share with you is around the strategic responses. Here, as I mentioned, since we're infusing elements of uh, innovation, we constructed those four scenarios around survive, adapt, expand, and transform, thinking about um, what are the necessary steps in terms of incremental innovation, disruptive innovation, or when you have to really go and transform the future of the company, you may have to take the radical innovation approach and um, uh, uh, completely reinvent who you are, what you stand for. And in that sense, uh, in the action space with the strategic responses is the place where we try to balance the proactive approaches to give agencies as opposed to only reactive to the environment. Uh, and we hope also to encourage with that a bit more emergence component of organizations thinking and framing their strategy for what does this mean for the future. Uh, with that, I wanted to close with some observations that we discovered in uh, the process of our work. First, we think that systemic design frameworks, uh, when they incorporate uh, tangible and intangible elements, they can have a big contribution to developing better strategies for impact and value creation. And we see them playing really important role in business specifically. The second observation is around this uh, importance to move from exploration into action and taking critical steps so that the systemic design approaches actually see a really broader use in the business context due to the significant benefits they can bring into the visioning and into the uh, implementation of such ambitious uh, programs that um, uh, overcome complex challenges. And lastly, we want to see multi-ocean strategy framework uh, as a connection of different disciplines like systemic design, ecosystem thinking, and also strategic design in order to find and bring to light those relevant insights that can help us collectively solve the challenges in the ecosystem economy. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cassie. I really very much appreciate it. I, I really like the framework with the, <laughs> the Here Be Monsters reference as well. So thank you Thanks. very much. Um, our next uh, presenters will be Emile, is Emile uh, Mazarant um, and his co-author in the paper, uh, Mieke van der Biel Brewer is also in attendance. They're both from Delft University of Technology and their paper is entitled the social dynamics of frame acceptance in organizational innovation settings. So that I'll hand it over to you, Emil. Thank you, JR. Um, yeah, different from other presenters thus far, we do not present a case or framework or study already. I think our paper we present makes a case for the social dynamic perspectives on frame acceptance, uh, considering a pivotal step in impactful innovation in organizational settings and works towards a research agenda in that sense. Um, I think to explain our um, 
um, the social dynamic perspective and why we think this is relevant, uh, I think I best start by sharing an example. Um, it's a story that is not my own, but very recognizable in many ways. And uh, a story I got from listening to an embedded social designer I interviewed earlier this year, and he shared an illustrative example with me why we may be served by a better understanding of the social dynamics and frame acceptance in organizational innovation settings specifically. Um, let's call our designer John for now. So that's to keep it anonymous for now. I have to, my slide doesn't shift. There it is. Um, the city that put John as an internal social designer on payroll just recently was facing a long lasting and increasingly pressing situation with respect to drug overdose in the city. And John and his team were asked to develop a kind of emergency app uh, to serve in case of overdose. Uh, to John, this seemed a rather simple solution in a very complex problem. And he soon found out that no research had been done uh, that showed that this would be a good solution uh, at all. Um, it kind of illustrates the knee-jerk response of the concerned department to brainstorm just within the existing assumptions and frame that they held about the situation. Uh, so John suggested to do a broader research into the problem situation and to find the better thing to do, uh, and also reducing the risk of doing the wrong things and actually making an argument uh, that clicked with the, uh, with the city that uh, asked of him to do so. Um, when being proposed to approach a situation in a designerly way, doing research together with the actual stakeholders in this situation, the organization at first displayed a lack of confidence in their own ability to do so. And they were quick, quick to propose to hire an external party to do so. Um, John figured that doing the research themselves would best allow them to understand and build empathy with the situation. So uh, him sharing his experience, he'd been doing that many times before and challenging their guts, uh, they got the involved people to actually follow John in doing it themselves. Uh, and backed by our direct leaders, uh, they assembled a team uh, using a designerly approach, uh, working closely together with stakeholders in society on a design research. And gradually in the team, um, they started to understand the situation in a different way. Um, However, mid-flight their research, a higher ranked actor from a different department came into this team's little project war room, uh, where all the ongoing research was visibly put on their walls and pictures and quotes, or whatever. Um, this actor got really angry, to say the least, and demanded the research to be stopped uh, effective immediately. Um, he'd not been involved in or by this design team. He was head of a department responsible for some of the actions that were currently undertaken to mitigate the problematic uh, situation with drug overdose. Uh, which basically uh, uh, contain campaigning against drug use and actions that made perfect sense within the dominant framing of the situation within the organization. John himself was not able to calm this man. And as John mentioned it to me, it was not acceptable, acceptable to do so from his position he had within this organization. It required the direct manager of John, a week of meetings with John together, and a whole lot of outside, real world, anecdotal and visual evidence from the research thus far to make him understand and accept the new frame that was evolving. And he came to see that the current actions of his department perhaps did not make much sense anymore and passed his current actions to wait for the forthcomings of the design project. As the design process continues, the new frame on the situation emerged with opportunities for novel inter interventions that just made sense within this new frame, but not within the pre-existing dominant frame within the organization. A while later, to ask for funding to realize what had come out of the design process, the design team was given the opportunity to present their six months of work in 10 minutes to a decision making maker very high up in the hierarchy. He is an actor that had not been involved at all up till that point. Basically, they were asking commitment on the novel actions with very little time to change the frame inside that room. In the room, where also John's manager was present, who had backed him up the team of John and John thus far, it soon became clear that this high-ranked actor at that moment was only looking for low-hanging fruit and low-risk opportunities, I think, connecting to what Crossy was also telling. And as a consequence, he rejected ideas that were designed to really change the system. And as John put it, this actor was not able to identify with the stakeholders in this situation, something that had helped the team so much to make new sense of this situation. 
As a result, the novel actions that were presented made too little sense with the old dominant frame of this person, but also of his role, uh, his position, and of this organization. The frame had emerged, evolved, and got man manifest in the actions of involved actors for many years, and even more so on a very personal level, this actor got really defensive. As a person, and from his role, he didn't seem to be able to justify identifying with his stakeholders and the situation on that spot in that time, and thus not with the actions that were proposed by the design team. John too got very personal and emotional in this meeting, and as he mentioned, clearly overstepped his position within the organization, almost requiring the high-ranked actor to get more personal, to do identify with these stakeholders too. Um, this direct manager of John, who had backed him up thus far, and although having accepted his new frame of this design team at that moment, in these meeting dynamics could not back up John anymore in that moment. The discussion was stopped and there was no commitment on the opportunities as presented by the design team. End of discussion. On a positive note, and interesting enough actually, the commitment that was given was that the team could present their opportunities, but there was a very uh, moment much later on to a, city emer uh, to, uh, to a city emergency center that was to be erected a little while later. And the research and the frame and the opportunities eventually were used to design new policy. Um, to me, this example illustrates some relevant aspects of the rationale of our paper in which we make a case for the social dynamic perspective on frame acceptance as a pivotal step in impactful social innovation and the frame acceptance of organizational actors that actually need to implement the actions that will change. First of all, back to systemic design, which applies design methods to bring about social innovation. For those innovations to be impactful, often a change of action in an existing organizational context is required. Actions and routine behaviors of organizational actors are guided by their existing frames. And the way we make sense of the situation provides us with this cognitive map. I think this is all not new to you, but helping us define and think of our goals, plans, and our action, what we value as good outcomes or even quality. Um, back to innovation, as Schumpeter once mentioned, innovation is a process of mutation of economic structures from within, destroying the old and creating the new which he called the creative destruction. It's a process of change and in the relation between exploration and exploitation following March. When successful, it will have replaced the old manifestations of ideas by new ones within this context, uh, a process taking place mostly between the people. Now, reframing is considered the core practice in design, and new design space is created by changing the way we make sense of a situation. From those new frames, novel action may follow that may not make sense within their pre-existing frames. Reframing challenges us to question our current assumptions about a situation, which we call the double, which is called the double loop learning by Jairus and Schoen. About learning, Wenger argued that people learn through social participation in communities of practice, which can be considered cross-functional, cross-departmental, cross-organizational, etc., even in social life. And in these communities, we learn how to make sense of situations, what we aim for and how we best approach these situations to achieve our goals. Organizations, and I think this is important, are in that sense the manifestations of the frames of its members. All actions in any moment make perfect sense within the existing frames. Frames are socially constructed, communicated, maintained, and changed. And this we follow Bartunic and Marsh from 1987. Now, designers create interventions to change a current situation to preferred one, requiring those change of actions of people that make sense within a novel frame. And we know that these frames are socially constructed, and design and innovation and learning have all been described as social processes. And in this social process, what individuals think and what they do is influenced by the behavior and doing of other individuals, called the social dynamics. Now back to our example. The knee-jerk response to problem solving is to what is popular called brainstorm, not challenging the existing assumption, single loop learning, finding solutions within the existing frames. Lack of confidence in this case kept people from doing things differently. It required John to work with that and to build confidence to take a leap in doing things differently. John could perhaps do that as he was considered more of an expert in this than other people present, but that's the guessing at this moment. 
They trusted John well enough to follow his lead and leap with him. The first angry higher rank man didn't accept the approach at first, and it required someone higher up in the hierarchy to calm the man down. This defensive, almost offensive reaction to whatever the designers have been doing was addressed by taking serious time to try and build empathy with the situation by showing and telling, and as John would call it, have him identify with the stakeholders in the situation, Made him, make him accept a new frame, opening up the space for novel actions to make sense. Now, the social dynamics in his meeting with the high, highest ranked actor describing, uh, described as a risk avoiding decision maker did not contribute to acceptance of the novel frame and a perceived more riskier action by this actor. The man referred to his role and diverted away instead of opening up. All these to me are examples of reframing at different levels, reframing our approach to dealing with problematic situations, reframing of the situation itself, of the theme, as you might call it, also perhaps of the individual and in the role level. In other words, how do I relate to this situation? All different human values, themes, and dynamic mechanisms at work, sometimes successful, sometimes not. To summarize, reframing is a core practice in design. Frame acceptance is pivotal in getting novel actions to be absorbed by this context. They are socially constructed and maintained, and organizations can be considered the manifestations of its current frames of its members. It requires double loop learning, which is a social process, and we are influenced in our thinking by the behavior of other actors. We found existing research on frame acceptance, however, to be focused on frame transactions and really lacking the social dynamic perspective. So it was not interactional, it was transactional, and it lacked the social dynamic perspective. However, there was some literature, and there is literature to be found on frame acceptance. What we do in our paper, we further conceptualize the central constructs in this uh, phenomenon based on a literature review, uh, looking at innovation, organization, frames, and reframing. And uh, next, we propose a research agenda. And my screen freezes here. Let me see. Uh, one of the things we think uh, is worth uh, researching is how the groups of individ individuals in those communities of practice socially determine what quality to them is. The next point is how does the perception of quality in those communities of practice shift under the influence of a new frame? And we currently set out to explore also my PhD research in what ways and to what extent do social dynamic factors influence the acceptance of those novel frames by relevant actors involved in reframing processes, specifically in organizational settings. And one can think of looking at the needs, the behavior strategy and values and um, Talking to a lot of social designers uh, recently, my first study, at least it's recognized, uh, considered relevant in that sense. Uh, and we do a lot of things implicitly and uh, perhaps it's time to make it more explicit also to, uh, to, to, to help practitioners to, uh, um, to make use of that and to gain the insight and build the, uh, the tools for that. Thank you very much. So thank you, Emil. Thank you for that that uh, review and the the example as as well. Just translating very quickly into the into the multi ocean framework. It, it I like how your example shows that sometimes actors themselves can become monsters, <laughs> especially if they're external actors and high ranking and maybe swimming in different oceans. Um, our uh, third paper in this this group um, will be presented by Elizabeth. Um, Shevkova. Uh, it was written uh, along with Elise Talgorn, Charlotte Kobus, uh, Jovan Engelin, Connie Backer, and Sonia Van Dam, all of whom are at Delta University of, of Technology. And it's entitled From Systemic Insights to Sustainable Business Actions, a Case Study on Gen Z Parents in the Doth Market. So we come full circle in this session from the parents with strollers at the, in our first presentation to now a case study of parents again. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Elizabeth, and I look forward to our conversations after the group. Thank you, yeah. Um, I hope everybody can hear me well. Okay, I see nodding, so that's all fine. Great. Um, well, yeah, I would like to share the uh, insights from my paper, which we already have been introduced to, as well as my co-authors, all from TU Delft, so more TU Delft people in this. Uh, today's session. Um, well, in 
today's complex and interconnected world, addressing sustainability challenges requires a systemic approach. I think this is something I don't have to explain more in detail. I think we will agree on that, that if we look at wicked complex problems such as sustainability, we need to think systemically and holistically. And um, in this work, I'm particularly looking into the environment, environmental impacts of innovation and businesses. So it also, again, ties a bit back of um, the first presentation, since we are having here more business perspective on it and how businesses can be more systemically and address circularity and sustainability problems more um, systemically. So I hope. OK, so. Um, and systemic design can be available approach to sustainable interventions from a business perspective. But um, so far in my research, there has been a gap identified between research and practice. So translating the systemic insights into feasible actions for businesses seems to be quite difficult. Um, not only the communication seems to be a problem, but then having actions based on this communication and on the understanding of this holistic and complex thinking seems to be quite a challenge. So this research tries to answer the question on how can systemic insights be effectively translated into feasible actions for businesses, so making the complexity and the holistic thinking um, feasible for businesses who so far seem to be more linear thinking, a bit more reductionist, which doesn't help with crisis like sustainability issues. And to answer this question and to explore it a bit, I have a business case study where I was working together with a lead, leading consumer healthcare brand focusing on sustainable parenthood to investigate this research. And as already mentioned at the beginning, the focus of the case study is to systemically analyze sustainability issues and needs of Gen Z first-time parents in the DACH market. And the DACH market is Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. And we choose this market since... Um, people in this market seem to be more open to sustainability and uh, have some kind of expertise where we can dive a bit deeper into the issues and concerns. And how did we approach this answering of the question in within the case study is um, I was following a four-step approach, which again, like I think most of you are familiar with how to think systemically and how to approach more systemic um, case studies. So the first step was to frame um, and get a data and define the boundaries of the problem space we want to understand better. It was followed by a system mapping step where uh, we used causal loop diagrams to really understand the causal relationships between all the variables. And once we had the system mapped, we were looking into analysis of the system by using Donella Meadows' theory on leverage points. So we were looking into which leverage points to address from the business. And at the end, once we understood and grasped the problem space, we wanted to look deeper into the system through exploration and validation from a uh, consumer perspective. So we had a qualitative study where we were um, validating and testing the insights we have found. So the first step was uh, framing and data gathering. With the business, we were deciding on three main topics, which were becoming the boundaries of our research and of the space we were identifying. The first uh, theme was sustainability in relation with healthcare and parenting, parenting as a business, and global trends relevant to Gen Z and millennials within the DACH market. So on these three topics, we agreed on. And then we started a quite extensive research where we were looking at internal business documents. We were looking at company interviews where we talked to all kinds of experts. And we also had a big literature review based on relevant keywords, which we agreed on with our business partners, but also added our own ideas. And at the end, we went over 70 documents. We looked at academic papers, journal articles, blog posts, but also we did some social media studies. We were following on Instagram and TikTok different kinds of parents and influencers to really understand what is the current mindset of young parents who want to be more sustainable. And at the end, we had all the data together. We mapped it. We had a huge data mapping in Miro and started clustering it. So for those interested, I can show it <laughs> at another point or you can reach out to me. Um, and the data mapping resulted in 17 topics, 
and each topic we wrote a short summary of to make the data a bit more graspable. And the next step in our systemic analysis was actually to map. So we had, as mentioned before, we had our 17 topics, each with a summary. And then we had a co-creation workshop to validate and, um, and explore this kind of uh, system maps. Um, we did it by having the summaries together and um, divided the summaries two different kinds of stakeholders from the business who had different expertise in design research and also in the topic itself. And we asked them to go over the insight cards and map the causal relationships. So we had the business partners doing this for us. And by that, reducing our own bias and also trying to get their perspective in it. And once we had our 17 mini, mini causal loop diagrams, we started connecting all those maps with each other to create a huge systemic map, which again is really, really big. I can show it later on if interested. For now, I would just like to show an example of one of those mini causal loop diagrams. So here you see the mini map of generals and work life in your families. We had like the little summary and we asked then our stakeholders to go over it and try to find the causal relationships and also see how they are in relation to each other, if they increase or decrease to each other and um, try to really get understanding of this particular topic based on the literature and the framing at the beginning. Well, and once we had our big system map based on all those 17 mini maps, we wanted to understand where we're on the right track. Does it really make sense where we are heading? And um, what are actually also the points of the system? So we started off with trying to understand what are the leverage points in the system and we're referring to um, fosterous work where we try to find the most um, like leverage points like reinforcing and balancing loops. We also started counting errors. So it's a bit more um, hard data driven. We tried to understand, okay, what are variables where we have five errors going in or out. And also through the high collaboration with the business, we also had an idea what kinds of trends are relevant and what kind of um, leverage points may be relevant for the business. So we highlighted them as well. So by that, we had quite a lot of leverage points in the uh, huge system map. And then we wanted to validate it. Are we on the right track? And we had a co-creation workshop to validate and rank the highest business leverage points based on feasibility, novelty, and impact. So again, like we had lots of communication and interaction with the businesses to really understand, okay, where are we going? And once we had all the leverage points mapped out and analyzed and validated, we used Meadows' work um, to understand which places to intervene in a system. So we started putting them into her framework to see what are the, in, the leverage points with the most impact and the least impact and which ones to target. And at the end, actually, this mapping in Meadows' work resulted in the highest ranked leverage points, so the paradigm which we need to transcend as the parents' dilemma of wanting to be to act eco-responsible but being immersed in triggers for overconsumption. So <laughs> quite a handful of complex words. And the business really didn't know what to do with this. So what we did, and this is the expertise of Elise, one of my co-authors, was systemic storytelling. We made some sketches and we told them a little story. So it ties a bit back to the first presentation where we tried to make the complexity tangible. And there we have mapped out the dilemma of wanting to be responsible, but having this overconsumption mentality and its two strains, what it means and how they're in a conflict to each other to really have a nice storytelling way. And there is a more holistic version where all the leverage points are mapped and all details are there as well. But for now, to just make the storyline clear and for the business comprehensible, we use this kind of simple story to explain what are the struggles of the parents. And once we had our story straight and the business was intrigued, we moved on to explore the storyline, this is the system, and also to validate if we're going towards the right direction. So we conducted a qualitative study where we found representative parents from the DACH market to gain further insights. 
but also to validate this dilemma we have discovered as the main paradigm to overcome. And uh, overall, we were following a convenience sample with snowball sampling, and we identified um, 13 parents between 22 and 30 and conducted 10 interviews. So some of the interviews were with both parents. To understand the underlying needs of parents, we used SMET and lettering, which are techniques to uncover conscious and unconscious um, needs through uh, qualitative studies. And um, followed by a mapping and um, also the trans transcription of the interview. So we transcribed all of them, then we started mapping and coding all the insights. So we had done quite a lot of clusters of information which were tying back to the dilemma which we wanted to understand and identify. And um, in this iterative process, we came at the end to 10 systemic insights which tie back to the leverage points which are reflecting the problem and needs of parents revolving around the identified dilemma of wanting to be sustainable, but being immersed in this consumption-driven world. And, well, but now we had our systemic insights, right? And how can we make them tangible to the business? Because the business was then again, what do we do with this? We used something the business was very familiar with, which is an insight card. It's a card, and this is the basic structure the business is used to, which gives information about the crucial insight for further product development. So <clears throat> once the business wants to develop a new innovation, they go to the insight cards and look at what kind of fundamental uh, information and uh, data is needed to develop a product. And by that, we tied back to a practice the business is familiar with, and we managed to linearize our systemic insights and make it a bit more tangible to them. So coming back to my research question, how can systemic insights be effectively translated into feasible actions for business? Um, for now, my answer is to use insights cards, which can bridge the gap between research and practice in communicating systemic design in a business context. It worked quite well, especially since we learned from the storytelling map, um, which we were together building with Elisa, was that the business really liked it and was excited about the storytelling, but they really didn't know what to do with it. So they needed more directions and they needed something they're familiar with. And that's why it was very nice to use a tool the business was very familiar with and foundational to the way of working. And by that, we reduced the abstraction of systemic insights. We linearized them a bit. We made it a bit more tangible. And we enabled them actually to have practical actions based on the information provided and still tied back to our storytelling and to the leverage points. Um, and here, I just want to briefly give an example of an insight card. So here, it says that sustainability is perceived. Uh, it's a bit covered that... Um, it's a privilege for families who have time and money for a sustainable lifestyle. So that's quite fundamental that sustainability is not accessible to everyone. And we filled it out with all the information which we had through the systemic analysis, through the system mapping, through the interviews, through the discussions and everything, and really have like more systemic effect as one of the leverage points to points to be addressed in the dilemma. And well. So as said, like we see that by using insight cards, systemic insights were made tangible, reducing the level of abstraction and complexity associated with system theory in a business context. But still, <clears throat> I want to be also critical of my own work. It still lacks. <laughs> At the end, um, the business was struggling a bit because we gave them insight cards, but we didn't give them concrete solutions. We helped. The insight cards will be used for product development, but still uh, immediate solutions weren't effort and it's still partially a bit too abstract to understand. Still uh, developing concrete solutions was outside of the scope of this research and would be a very interesting follow up step. And overall, we learned through discussions with the business that we need more strategic thinking beyond the insight cards. Um, to really effectively address the identified leverage points. So 
another very interesting learning in this whole process, which we were reflecting later on with the business, was that uh, systemic design is interesting and valuable, but it's also complex and time consuming. This project took us five, six months, more or less. It was my graduation project. And um, it required the business to think more holistically, which the business was not really used to. It challenged them in many ways. And they really had to familiarize with, with the new way of thinking, but also with the language of systemic design. It was really something new, something challenging to them. And they showed, and there were like limitations in communications when it comes to that. So there will be other means of communication needed next to inside cards and um, storytelling to have a more effective way of communicating, systemic and more holistic thinking when wanting to address sustainability issues. But we do believe that this research can be seen as a first step uh, for a pathway forward to approach sustainable business impact more systemically. So yeah, if there are any questions, I'm very happy to answer them. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you to all, all three presenters. And um, as I open it up, I'll just take a, a cue from Elizabeth, you, or your final slide where you said that systemic insights were made tangible through uh, insight cards. And one of the um, themes that connects these, these the three papers in the second group is that question of the, I think, the tangible and the intangible and making the bringing the intangible into the design process, uh, whether that's explicit in the, um, the uh, the ocean multi-ocean strategies framework of making the intangible into things like oceans and and, and tangible uh, monsters. Um, whether it's in in uh, Emile's paper with the the social dynamics, which are very intangible but have very tangible effects, even to the sense of you know taking research off the walls and and stopping timelines in in in, in their tracks in the in the moment. And then in the um, of course in the final paper that question of how to have systemic insights or concerns like sustainability, which are intangible, and make them into, into a tangible artifact. So there's that connection, and then all three papers have offer solutions or techniques for doing that, whether it's in the multi-ocean strategy um, the, in, in the first paper. The, the reframing and frame acceptance, I think, is, is, is in the second paper of being able to accept the frame so that we can, can make these, um, these different perspectives more tangible. And then again, in the third one, whether it's through this co-design of casual loop um, diagrams or then translating those into insight cards. So there's a lot of techniques for, for um, making the, the intangible tangible in these papers. I think that's a really fruitful discussion. Uh, but with that, um, before I say more, I'll open it up to the others um, that are here in attendance to see if there are questions for any of these three panelists. I have a clarifying question for Elizabeth, if I may. Yeah, I was wondering these these um, these insight cards. Who do you, who in these organizations did you use it with? What kind of actor level or what actors were they? Um, we used it first of all. We validated them with the R and D department. So this is the department which develops them, but they actually give it further to the innovation and design department. So. It's streamlined towards designers. So I, the language and the way of thinking, I think, is very design driven. Yeah. And it, 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 you kind of use it in the exploration, people who are used in exploring. It's not the exploitation yet, those people have to. No, I mean, we, I think most of us are very familiar with the process of designing. So you need at the beginning some kind of briefing and framing and those inside cards should give the direction of of the upcoming design innovations um and that was the idea to actually um take a step back as a business and not only think when it comes to sustainability or oh, let's do i don't know biodegradable plastic but actually think more holistically what is the cause and how can we communicate this cause and translate it into a product um, or service system or whatever solution. So I think this is where the nuances come in then just using more reductionist solutions. Yeah, the reason I'm asking because you kind of, from what I get now is that you um, apply it, you use it with people who kind of professionally already 
uh, are looking for different ways and are taking step backs, reflecting, etc. Right? Do you have any clues, ideas, or reflections uh, with these people? Also, how they think to bring this further, or whether it's useful to useful mm -hmm. to bring further? Or? So basically, there was quite a lot of follow up um, after the inside cards, and yeah. we and I mentioned this also towards the end. We need also to think a bit more strategically. So the inside cards were actually put also in a roadmap of short term and long term solutions. And we actually tried to uh, put it down in different horizons. So the business was then quite happy because it was wordings and um, methodologies they're used to. Um, so overall, the reflection worked out quite well. But <clears throat> the main conflict I've encountered is. Uh, moving away from consumption and I think this was also a bit what Ries mentioned at the beginning that if you want to be sustainable you have to move against the paradigm of economy uh, of growth and that causes quite a lot of discussions and the business wasn't very excited about it <laughs> so we put it like in the last horizon which was a bit more radical way of thinking thank you Maybe I can just give a question to Cassie. Um, I was wondering, because I really liked your ocean framework and I kept thinking about um, how your experiences were when you made it, when you have a case study, maybe somebody actually trying it out and how the reactions were. Because in my experience, um, what I did was already a bit overwhelming for certain people. <laughs> and yours is, um, I would say, even more daring to bring new language, a new way of thinking and phrasing things in new ways. And and do you have any experiences how people perceived um, when they practically experienced your framework? Uh, thank you for the question. I actually would like uh, Kevin, Kevin Richard, who is uh, a co-author on the paper to uh, join us and give him the opportunity to share a few words. Uh, and we did have a lot of experience on that domain. So Kevin can, uh, can answer. Thank you, Crazy. And thank you for the question, Elizabeth. Um, so, th yeah, that's a really good question. And uh, we had some people uh, having the same, basically the same thoughts when they, they, they first encountered the, the framework and the components and um, wondering how they would be able to apply this in their context. And when we tried it with people, uh, what we realized is so what we are using is metaphors. We are not saying what those metaphors are exactly for people, right? So we let them interpret from their own terms what, what obsession means in their context or what the maverick is in, in their own context. So we, we don't really like provide a proxy language for technical definitions. We just use um like more like um a way of um, explain, expressing ideas for them and reinterpret it in their in their own ways, right? So, yes, people that are really really into rational thinking and really like linear approach, they tend to have a bit more difficulty to, at the beginning to to enter the game. But because it's something that is generative and based on this um, gamified approach, uh, people tend to to play the game and um, and they're often like surprised by by themselves to be more creative than what they expected to be. Um, so it's it's um yeah it can be of course um, a limitation of such frameworks because they they seems like to be uh, strange for 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 the for certain audience. Uh, but they they request to be experienced to be to be actually understood. So I hope I understand. I answered the question. Yeah, yeah, it was nice. Then maybe just a last follow up, and then I give stage to other questions. Of course, is um, did you experience any uh, boundaries of different contexts? Because um, in in my research, I'm I'm having quite often discussions which are very valuable about do is a commercial environment different than a social environment, and um, in terms of sustainability i do see some differences but i'm wondering if you've experienced any 
differences of different um, environments when it comes to the applicability of your framework? Uh, I don't know if um, I don't know if you if you want to add something. Um, if you have some, I would say that uh, not so far. Um, and we've tested in the last uh, couple of months in uh, quite different audiences on a uh, uh, cross industry level, also on an individual level, and uh, with um, a sy systemic innovation forum. So there were mainly systemic designers uh, playing with the framework. But we haven't encountered any any roadblock or limitation. I think this adaptability and the modularity of the approach to uh, tailor to the context give us a lot of flexibility uh, to be broadly applicable. Amazing! But, uh, it's really really interesting to hear. Thank you. But caveat to to that is that we. We don't claim to have experienced it in every possible context either, right? So we're not claiming Absolutely. that it works in every <laughs> context. And uh, something that uh, that is uh, th that is important to say is we do a, um, a prior work before introducing the framework to make sure that it fits in in the context in which it will be used. So it's not just a ready to be used uh, tool. It necessitates um, some kind of um, like the, the the components remains the same, but mm -hmm. we have to present it in a way that makes sense for them, right? So you need to understand a bit where where, where you you put your, but where, where you are going uh, with mm -hmm. that, so it makes it makes more sense, right? Because otherwise it's it's really too abstract and makes no sense. In other words, we have to apply the translation layer because everything is mapped to the context. Monsters are mapped, players are mapped, oceans are mapped, and then it's very clear. But this translation layer is absolute must. Otherwise, mm. it's confusing. Yeah, and I assume also facilitation is key as well. Like you can't just step away once people are introduced to this. Um. Yes, and uh, I forgot to mention that the tool is actually available on Miro, the collaborative platform. And for each of these strategic responses, we have a key questions that we guide the participants uh, towards. So to that extent, yes, facilitation is necessary, but also we made sure that um, we give the agency of the people who want to play with it to be independent. Yeah, the, the padding we had at some point was to to imagine the the, meta, the like the, the framework as a um, as a game, like a physical game, like you play with you know actual uh, PCs, like, and then people should be like somewhat. Um, uh, autonomous in in the approach to the game, right? So um, we are not there yet exactly, but it's one of the the thing we we sh we would like to to have with this framework. Amazing! Thank you so much. And I maybe have another follow up on for um, on on that as well, Rossi and Kevin. That both the the other papers both dealt with kind of. Um, Interactions are dealing with kind of structures, either business or corporate structures or other actors that are outside of the design frame. I think whether it's translating things to the insight card or the person who comes into the design room in Emile's um, example. And in in so I wonder if 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 your if your research you also had any um looked at 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 how then the game gets moved out of that the, the frame of the the the, the multi-ocean game. To these other contexts, or if that if that's not within your 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 research, I don't know if you if you let if it's just the meaningfulness of being in the the game, then the actors take it back into their context and and and, and translate it back into the into the workplace. Um, so I was wondering if you had any insights of yeah of how then it translates out of that frame back into kind of other uh, other other frames of the workplace, or a, whether it's a business environment or a, or a, a work environment. And, and, and then in that, so that's the question for you. And then in, in the kind of pairing question to Emil, um, in those kind of shifts, if Emil, you could afterwards then also comment a little bit more about that double loop learning process that you mentioned, because it seems that that's so key to moving not just between actors, but especially different people who are in different, very different frames, those who are in the design context frame and those who are, for an example, the administrative frame. They're not even in another ocean, they're perhaps they're in another planet entirely. So 
if you could kind of talk about the double learning process, um, that's my uh, and how that how that works in that frame shifting, and and then for the Krasi and Kevin, if you could talk about it, if your work also did look at how those who were in the game frame then brought that out into other frames of their their work settings. Uh, maybe I can begin and then I can uh, uh, ask Kevin to contribute. So there are two aspects of how um, we intersect the rest of the processes in the organization. And on one hand, we have those insights, which can be easily shared and made uh, applicable to different uh, parts of the product team or innovation team or you use a research team or even strategy team. So that's one aspect. And the other one is related to actually implementing these strategies because we we put a lot of emphasis into taking strategy into action. So this implementation and specific action steps that organization take is how we create a connection so that the uh, framework um, is carried further and it's not in isolation, but integrated with the objectives of what teams have to work towards and uh, uh, see practical, practical uh, results out of uh, such ideation process. Yes, and to 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 add to that, uh, we we something we we really aim with with this kind of framework is to let people really be able to like something that is important. It is is this two side of the process which the, the framework enables, which is this abstraction step, which is for us something necessary for interpretation, and then the recontextualization of what people understood through. The going through the abstraction using the metaphor to then going back to their context and to create those kind of insights. But then <clears throat> we don't claim to have all the tools within the framework. We, we are really open about that and we welcome other tools to come in and let people take them in and just apply what they think makes sense in their context, in the tool that makes sense to them to make it more like actionable as well for them. So we have this uh, quite open, open approach uh, with, the, with the framework. Uh, it's not an all encompassing framework with everything inside. It's really not a point, but it's to be able to understand the situation and then take action with whatever means makes the most, most sense for, for, for whomever use the, the framework. Will I try and answer the question you had to me, yeah, JR? <laughs> I think it's it's kind of an essential question. I think to be to be studied. I think um, yes, this double loop learning is kind of um, pivotal. I think to 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 bring about the frame shifts at different levels. Um, and not only from an actor's point of view, I mean, challenging assumptions about how we approach situations or how we go about it innovating at all, or to challenge the way we look at the situation, we frame the situation, the things we've come to do for so long um, at many different levels, but and, and listening to, to, to a lot of social design, designers in, in the broader sense of the, the past months, I think there's also this tendency that the what I see from from my point of view is this tendency of designers to at the in the fuzzy front end to collect a lot of people as we also see in this frameworking, and with these actors we we come together and there's there's this co-creation kind of thing where where kind of in the framework our assumptions are being challenged, um, but at some point there's other actors inside these organizations that. We're not part of this process, but they will also need to start changing their actions as a consequence of what we want to um, be in impactful with. And that's another, my guess right now is that, uh, my take right now is that that's another kind of le learning that needs to take place, uh, not in this long co-creation settings, but I mean, if, if, if one is the, the slow cooking, in the fuzzy front then that may there's the cat of me if one is the, the slow cooking maybe the other one is the wall like out coming out of this co-creation going into an organization we find actors that we want to double we want to question their assumptions uh, but then 
it's always in, in, in smaller interactions or meetings, whatever, we have limit, more limited time. We don't have the same time anymore. We also require them to double, uh, to, to, to learn, uh, to challenge their assumptions. And I think looking at dynamics then, um, who do you accept? What behaviors require to, to gain confidence to do it in a different way is one, maybe at the fuzzy front end to, to start exploring. But then these are these high ranked actors, for example, then there's so apparently there's a lot of other things that, I mean, who's, who's, uh, is, how do you call it, uh, legitimized to actually challenge your assumptions? Like, where are you? Who are you? Uh, to 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 ask of me to reconsider how we've been doing things for so long, and then of course we have different departments, and I mean every, all our frames, the companies, the organizations I work with, everything is manifested to the level of KPIs. Um, okay, so if we start to challenge things, that kind of means something, but it is central to learning in that sense. I mean. Single loop learning doesn't bring us reframe, right? I'll open, of course, the discussion to any of the uh, papers that were presented in the entire panel, if anyone has them. And I also have um, a question for um, Elizabeth about the um, the co-design workshops you did with the causal loop diagrams and, and kind of the, again that work of translation that's necessary to do that co-design. Um, this is also a question that's related to an act, it's an activity that we will be doing in Washington DC when representatives of various hubs and um, gather and other participants for the, the final um, uh, event of, of, of RSD12. But in that, um, when you worked and did those co-design workshops with the 17 kind of factors and, and made the causal loop diagrams, uh what was the process of 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 um of those workshops was it did you find it for the participants that they kind of with the brief cards they were able to kind of jump in and start those diagrams or or was there was there necessary kind of um teaching moments or demonstrations or um yeah, well, how, yeah, how, how was the process? How did you get them involved in the co-design to, to kind of get consistent um, consistent artifacts that were causal loop diagrams that could they could be kind of compared with each other? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a very good question. And uh, while we were preparing the co-creation workshop, we were <laughs> thinking quite a lot about it. I think, first of all, we had the big advantage of having the people uh, from the start, from the defining the system boundaries that were involved. So there was already uh, quite a lot of understanding of the topic and they were highly engaged in the topic in general. So we had the leverage of all the excitement and also understanding already what is the idea, what we are doing. Um, and at the beginning of the workshop, we did a little bit of a crash course on causal loop diagrams. So we, we prepared everything. It was a bit during COVID, so everything was still uh, online. So we prepared it all in Miro, and we did a bit of gamification. I think that ties back also to the ocean framework. So we actually showed them um, um, a bit of the vocabulary and how to draw these relations and gave them some examples with some funny, um, I don't know, that... Um, with some funny variables, actually, I, I I can't think of a good example right now, which we had, but it was something like, um, good food increases happiness or something like this. So then people immediately understood, okay, what are variables? Uh, how can they relate to each other? And um, they were actually quite excited. And the summaries we tried also to keep it a bit more short, so it's not like that you have to read a whole A4 page. But since there was quite a lot of pre-knowledge, sometimes they added some variables they considered important. And um, me and my uh, co-researchers, we just joined as facilitators. So that's what maybe ties back a bit to my question to um, Cassie. And um, because facilitation is quite key, I think, in, in this kind of complex moment, uh, people get lost or demotivated. So we were like quite engaged into facilitating and keeping the conversation going. 
Um, and I think at the end, we also reviewed and we asked the participants to uh, present their little causal loop diagrams to each other. So this stirred also discussion and they were already drawing some connections and were, again, highly engaged, but because they were passionate about the topic as well. So I think that shows, but I can also, if you're interested, I can show also the setup in Miro, how it looked like. So I'm, everything I do is like <laughs> easy accessible. Well, I hope that answered it. Yeah, I, I, I mean, one thing I will say in terms of the, the, the Miro boards, and there's been a few mentions, I think if there's anything that anyone uh, wishes to, to kind of share or, or, or um, that uh, with slides or Miro boards, you can certainly both put it in the, in the ch chat, because I believe that the chat is also will be available when people watch the recordings later on. And then you can also, in the email that I sent out about the panel, if you wish to share it, then we can have those in one place from the, from the panelists as well. So if anyone has any yeah, boards or slides they want to um, share, they can do that as well. And I think putting in the chat, it then stays paired with the, the video as people um, rewatch the, the video in the next few months. That's nice, yeah. Yeah, nice, I, I will drop in my, um, I, I prepared this as PDFs because of confidential, Reality reasons we couldn't make it accessible, but um, you can zoom in into the most smallest detail there. But uh, maybe I will ask you, Jaya. So you have a causal loop diagram mapping soon coming up? Well, I, not exactly causal loop um, mapping diagrams, but uh, see my um, Evan Barber here, the, the the convener of the of RSD twelve, and and. Um, and I'm the, the co-organizer of the local hub at Washington, D.C. And next week, when representatives from many of the hubs come together and the um, and other uh, local attendees come together for the culminating event, we won't be doing causal loop diagrams exactly, but we do have a diagramming event where we'll take the topics of the various 12 hubs and we'll um, map connections between them. And then yeah. kind of have a walkabout exercise to see how those um, to... Um, to, to see the, the, the connections that arise in making system maps of what the hubs foci were and, and step back and analyze those as kind of a, a uh, synthetic event to reflect on the, the entire online um, online course of RSD. So. Nice. Yeah, maybe also I was asking because I had another thing regarding your question in mind. I think what helped at our workshop a lot, and it, it reminds me of the structure you suggested, is to break it down into multiple mappings. Because um, in one of our key learnings when it came to mapping, you can't give a intensely big chunk of information to for people to process. It's, it's, it's really not digestible, and it loses quality. So that's why we try to break it down in those mini causal loop diagrams and later on draw the causal connections to make co-creation digestible. Otherwise, it's too much of a commitment and too overwhelming. So I think when it comes to complexity, there's like this small line of um, zooming in without um, linearizing too much or reducing too much content. And that was quite challenging, I must say, when it came to the mapping for my work as well, and then zooming out into the big map and then zooming in into points and translating them. So this whole translation work of um, not oversimplifying insights and leverage points, and also in the system mapping, I, I find it extremely challenging. So <laughs> I think that's maybe interesting to share also. Maybe somebody else had experience with this kind of back and forward movement. Yeah, Elizabeth, I'd like to say that's a really interesting point in terms of systems. <clears throat> it's a real classic systems thing. Yeah. Talking it to many colleagues over the years, call, I used to call it like um, the GPS issue, that you can you, you have to have an overview and you can talk about a street, but if you don't tell what the city is, then the name of the street is irrelevant. So you need to simultaneously have like a, an overview and and a focus at the same time. They're never decoupled. And I think you run into trouble when you do decouple them or you're you're somehow losing focus that you you've forgotten the whole list, you know, the macro micro. They can't ever be decoupled. 
if you, you they, they can be in terms of when you're focusing at a particular time, but they always need to be connected. Or you as the practitioner or the person doing it needs to always maintain that relationship while you're doing a thousand other things. So it isn't easy. I think the only answer to that is practice, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I can imagine. I also think it raises, as in many, many, many cases similar to this and others, the question of ownership. Who owns this big overview when it comes to complexity? Um, because I everybody and nobody, everyone and no one, <laughs> right? Yeah, so yeah. You need to make people feel like they do have ownership, otherwise, why bother engaging? Um, but all the same, everybody's point is relevant. So it's everybody and nobody. That's in, that's why. You get the big bucks, right? It's difficult. <laughs> I guess, yeah. Thank you. It was really good. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I also, just to follow up also with Crossy and Kevin on the, the point we were just discussing, in terms of kind of making complexity or dealing with complexity, on, in your multi-ocean framework, you had very specific numbers for each of the four kind of quality or actors aspects of the of the of the game did those arise organically or did you have specific reasons on why there are, you know four monsters this many this many actors um is that is that part of the mechanics or how did those numbers um arise because because that helps really frame for lack of a better word all the complexity within a, a certain limited set of actions I think they were rather emerging <laughs> and also arriving organically. Um, and through testing, we actually discovered, for example, that we needed uh, to add more players, uh, whereas the oceans uh, we borrow from nature. So we had some a strong association with uh, the oceans uh, there. Uh, and we tried to also make sure that we don't have too many or too little. So this was a, a tough one um, to find the right balance. But um, I would say through experimentation is the best way to see if the framework is limiting or is it uh, encompassing enough. And so far, we, we are in a balanced state. Yes, but we, we also open the, the possibility for um, any application of the framework to allow a space for more players or more monsters. Like if, if one makes more sense, um, that is not even in the list. Then, then they can add it. Uh, they can um, say what what it referred to for them. Uh, so it, it's not really limited. We have a, a basic set because we we need to start somewhere. And as Crazy men mentioned, we need enough interactivity between the enough parts and enough interactions between the parts to to make it more like uh, useful for people to, to take out something out of it. Um, but um, but it's open for for adaptation when when needed. For instance, the metaphors themselves, they are really uh, Western-centric, right? The, the Leviathan and stuff like that. It, they speak to people with with an understanding of this kind of monsters, but, but pe perhaps in Asia, um, those monsters makes no sense, and then they might be something totally different. And we are totally open for, for that as well. So, um, yeah. But but just to mention, it's it's where maybe we we are, like Crazy mentioned in the presentation, but we connect to system thinking, but we don't come from a system a systemic design uh, perspective first, right? So it's it's kind of different. We connect it to systemic design in the application because it makes a lot of sense. But um, what I want to say is like we we are really like um, the tool is um, a self identification and then self interpretation um scaffolding basically it's it's a scaffolding for people to interpret and, and act and it's um it's not like um, a formal tool as we can find in traditional sense of systemic design and systems practices like the causal diagram which which is formal in this way which is also highly rational in its approach uh we don't do that basically the connections are loose loose People decide whatever it means for them. It's fine, 
and we don't have like this strong um hard coded relationships we don't look for that we look, we look for for these kind of loose interpretations and loose connections between things um and this is where we we really tackle on the the generative aspect of the of the approach and and less in this formalization of the of the framework itself so it's it's where maybe perhaps it's 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 different yeah um maybe also kevin what you were saying one thing particularly i found very interesting that you were saying your framework is quite western centric which i think is a yeah, <laughs> it's something we can't deny and that's that's fine yes but i draw then the connection and the question actually goes to emil and mika did you saw like is your perspective also a bit western centering or do you feel like it's more universal when it comes to this uh, dynamics or i don't know <laughs> any thoughts or reactions on that i think my journey in this whole research started by reading a, a paper a study by lee Singapore, where a design student, they, they actually focused on frame acceptance in uh, in a governmental setting in this sense. And there was this um, study of what took place between design students, a female student, young, uh, trying to bring across or transact their uh, view of the situation to a senior male Asian uh, official. That was my first thought, okay, was it the frame that didn't get accepted or was it the situation that actually had part in it? I don't know because it was not studied, I wasn't there, but it was my first thought. And um, I think dynamics in that sense and social dynamics can play a role anywhere. I mean, it's, it's interesting to see if they are different over time, I guess. But let's first start... Uh, Mika perhaps wants to add something, but um, well, actually, I think it's a really interesting question. It is. Um, yeah, because I was uh, thinking also of my experience working also with indigenous communities in Australia, and um, I think social dynamics is everywhere. Um, uh, but I think the perspectives on uh, how we see the world are really quite different and also where they're coming from and the intergenerational uh, perspectives. Uh, and also, I think, you know, the whole idea of double up learning and stuff is very cognitive, right? It's very much in the head. Uh, well, that, I think that's quite a Western perspective, right, on how we think about design. So, um, so I do think our perspective is definitely Western. <laughs> I have no idea what the consequences are, but it would be interesting maybe also to explore that a little bit further, even if just as a thought experiment. Yeah, and maybe even consider some uh, components of intuition. How does it play into it and uh, uh, dive deeper into this idea of tacit knowledge as opposed to explicit? It would be really cool to see what this would mean. Yeah. And also, I assume there's also, I found it super interesting, Miki, what you said that you have been working with indigenous people, because I think then there comes another very interesting layer of Western people going into different cultural environments and exploring it. So that adds a new layer of social dynamics by having <laughs> this kind of cultures collide with each other. So maybe even the researcher having a different cultural background I'm not sure um, how the approach of your research was, but I'm, I don't know, it just um, made me wonder if this adds on the complexity we're already encountering here. No, I think that's a really good comment because then we're talking about paradigms, right? We can't really talk about frames without talking about the paradigms. So, Emil, there's something for you <laughs> to add to your conceptual framework. <laughs> I mean, I think that I think that is a really interesting question, and ex especially with the connection and the um, the elevation, also in the role, the place of ethnography as a as a as a 
method that that contributes to so much design research and of course all the wrestle is wrestling with um, ethnography and reflexive ethnography that you know from anthropological studies and um, where they wrestle with these intents of encounter all the time um, but I but I think in, in parallel to that or to kind of cross cut that what one thing that's really interesting about these papers all, all, all six papers and about reframing is that when you reestablish that frame, and in, in a game or in a, in a specific activity or in a design activity, then it it also kind of makes it its own frame that's outside of those those dynamics of encounter. It's its place of its of unique encounters um, um, occur within that frame. And I think that's maybe mostly showed most dramatically when there is like a gamification or if there's something like the multi ocean framework where you shift into a direct frame. But anytime I think there's a co um, co design strategy. It's making that kind of new liminal frame space to try to part of that innovation is to try to get those new um, social dynamics going. Um, the trick, I think, as Z Meal's paper points out, is always to how to leave some of the other social dynamics maybe at, at the door. But that, that question of how to go back and forth between yeah, the complexity that's outside versus the complexity with inside the design space is, is, is a really, um, really, really interesting one and in how you both need to put deliberate boundaries around it or um, those boundaries kind of um, arise or organically or they don't arise or they collapse organically that those I think all those processes are, are worthy of consideration. Thank you. Well to maybe just to, to add to that uh, something that is absolutely not in in our paper that, but that is interesting it comes from a paper I can I don't remember exactly uh, the names of the the writers, but uh, which was interesting because he were this person were exploring the 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 dynamics in social innovations, especially for governments type of applications, and they came with this idea of soft, soft spaces and hard spaces, um, and and oftentimes they mentioned the hard spaces to be the most par paradigmatic. Uh, spaces, whereas the soft spaces are they are more fluid in the paddings, right? So um, they're low for this um, blending of perspectives or much more easily. Um, and and people do have in social interactions way more loose relationships to their pers to their perspective or to their to their paddings, right? When we exchange together, we we don't necessarily come from similar backgrounds, we, Jesse and I, uh, we are not academics, for instance, and we, still we have this, we have discussions around this kind of tools and this kind of things, which is not really a problem despite differences, right? And, and that, that shows that it's kind of fluid. Uh, where, whereas once we want to formalize that, then, then it becomes obviously less, less fluid. And this is this, um, uh, I mean, it's it's not really a dichotomy. It's like uh, it's like praxis, praxis I was mentioning before. It's like it's hand hand in hand, like things that go together, right? So, um, <clears throat> um, yeah, I don't know where I want to go with that, but uh, I kind of find it interesting in the context of this discussion. Well, that I'll, I'll open it and see if there, anyone has any last question or any last concluding thoughts that they wish to to share. And, and if not, uh, thank you very, very much to all, all presenters. I, a very um, similar and wonderful panel, and the, and the discussion was, was fantastic as well. Uh, the, the recordings, I think, will be available, at least we said online, through the, the next few months. So feel free to share them with your, your colleagues. And um, if no one else has anything to, to say, I wish everyone a good um, afternoon or evening or morning or, or midnight, wherever you may, may be around, around the world. And thank you again to all the, all the presenters. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all. Bye.